Morning guys, how you doing? Um, I'm sorry, I should have given you more warning of this, uh, but I cannot do a class on, on Wednesday. I think this will be the last class I miss. Um, it's a little bit just a product of my chaotic, busy life, um, which is fun, but sometimes a little out of control. So specifically, um, to give you guys a sense of what's going on and, and what I guess some profs do outside of the classroom, um, I'm giving a presentation in Sunnyvale, California. Um, yeah, I know the, you guys have a polar vortex um, descending on Toronto, and I'm basically scooting out to uh, the San Francisco area. Um, but I mean, just to give you a sense, this is an event that um, that U of T is sort of sponsoring on the future of higher education. Um, it's one where they invite uh, a lot of U of T alumni who, you know, many of whom are in the Bay Area. Uh, and so it's a discussion, I don't know if you guys know about these so-called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. I taught one of them uh, on introductory psychology and they're basically free courses online that anybody can take. They don't get any kind of um, accreditation so you don't get a degree, uh, but basically almost any topic you'd like to learn more about there's a course uh, online. Uh, if you're interested, the, the, the group that I used, or the, the platform, I guess, that my course is on, uh, and, and many are, oh my goodness, there we are, it's called Coursera, and literally you can, you can type in anything um, you want to learn more about, and you will find a list of, of courses um, that are you know, related to that topic, whatever that topic is. Um, so should you want introduction to psychology, for example, you would find somewhere here, where am I? <laughs> somewhere here is me. Really? Okay. Why are there all these introductions and there's not an introduction to psychology? That's kind of... Uh, maybe I call it introductory psychology. Well, anyway, here's some courses on psychology. Mine is there somewhere. It's got little goldfish, so I would recognize it. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why it's not showing up. It's kind of strange. It's, uh, anyway, it's, it's there. Believe me. And there's this event. So I'm going to be talking as part of this event. Uh, which should be a lot of fun. So that's why I'm not here. Um, now when I was looking at creating this uh, lecture for you guys, I was looking first of all at the slides that um, I was planning to present and obviously I typically go long on the previous lecture because there's only a few slides in the current lecture. So after debating a little bit, um, I usually like to do my little um, impressive memory trick live. Um, but after debating a little bit, I realized I think there's a way I can do it not live that I hope you still believe me is impressive. Uh, and so I'm going to try. So we're going to take over where we left off, which was on this slide. Um, let me just make it a little bit bigger so we have a little more room to work with here. Um, and again, I want to walk you through it. I always hate at the end of class I get all rushed. So this time I'm going to go a little slower and walk you through it. Um, and let me begin literally with this list. As I described before, what I'm, what I'm going to show you here is a mnemonic strategy. So people always will ask with memory, well, can my memory be better? Uh, and the answer is yes. And that's really what the lecture is going to be about today. Uh, but I want to begin with this as a context for you to think about the issues we describe. So I'm going to highlight a few things as we go. The first thing is, in order to remember something well, you have to first pay attention when you're experiencing that thing. We're going to call that encoding. So you have to encode it well. Secondly, you have to now store it in your brain in some durable way. And third, you then have to be able to retrieve it effectively later. Um, so you need all those three, encoding, storage, and retrieval. All three have to work in order for you to successfully remember something. So sometimes if you're trying to enhance your ability to remember something, it starts at encoding. It starts by learning the information in a manner that will make it 
easy to retrieve, mostly. It's kind of thinking about the encoding and the retrieval part. And so what I'm doing with these words is I'm giving myself hooks. You can think of it that way. I'm going to show you that I can learn a list of 14 random words in order in a relatively short time. Um, but my ability to do this is going to be critically dependent on these hooks. And so again, what these words are, are just words that describe my normal daily ritual. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to, um, I'm going to ch cheat on one of these and then I'll, I'll uh, so I'm going to duplicate this slide here. Now I've duplicated an empty one. I'll show you why. So we're going to start with this, this one, and what we're going to do is just add random words. Now, as you know, normally I just ask you to call out these words in class, and I add them. Um, how am I going to do that without you guys? Um, let me just minimize this one for now. Well, you know, thanks to that amazing thing called the Internet, I found this creative word generator, random word. Uh, I'm going to refresh my screen just so you know. It's like I'm a magician now. No, no... Um, tricks up my sleeve. Um, but what this will allow you to do is I can just click on that word and it'll give me another random word. So I'm just going to add some of these. So this is, let, let's just do about four at a time. So tusk, there we are, toffee, melon. A little further, uh, okay, sorry. Remember I am tusk. Toffee, melon, okay, go back here, reason, memory, <laughs> lemonade, this is faster than when you guys call it. Pottery, nib, bill, donut, knitting, nappy. Okay. Donut, knitting, oops, knit, nappy, nappies with two P's or one P? Yeah, two P's, okay. Skylight, publicity, lead. Oh, I guess just skylight publicity. All right, skylight, publicity. Okay, 14 random words. How am I going to remember these? Okay, so let me maximize this now so you can get a sense of, of what we're going to do. Um, all right. What I'm going to do is now try to connect these words to those words. So remember, these. this is just my morning routine. I wake up in bed, I have breakfast, I go for a walk with my dogs, I iron my clothes, have a shower, get dressed, hop in my car. On the way to the school, I go buy Mo at high school, I go buy... Oh yeah, I was supposed to change that. Highland Creek Valley. I go by the church, the mosque, into the parking lot, grab a coffee, come to class. So just by going through my routine, I should be able to remember these words. And so now the trick will be to form some sort of connection between these things I know I can remember and these things I want to remember. So I want to associate these things. All right, so let's just do it. The best way to do this is to create a sort of story that includes a lot of what's called bizarre imagery, strange things. So I wake up in bed, I roll over in bed, and geez, I roll over on top of this giant elephant tusk that somebody left in the bed, and it kind of stabs me. It's like, what the heck is this tusk doing in my bed? All right, there's an image rolling over onto a tusk. Uh, I go down for breakfast, and I'm curious what we're going to have for breakfast, and what I see is a nice plate of toffee. Toffee. I pop one in my mouth, and I think, oh my goodness, this is just too sweet for breakfast. I cannot have toffee for breakfast. Um, so, I'm disappointed. 
um, in my breakfast. But I go for a walk with my dogs, and as I'm walking along, I come to this rock, and sitting on the rock is a melon sitting right there. And I'm like, cool, that's what I would rather have for breakfast. And so I sit on the rock, and I eat the melon watching the sunrise. I, don't know, I just added that for fun. All right, fine. Get back from the walk, and now I have to iron my clothes. And I always wonder when I iron my clothes, like, why do I have to iron the stupid clothes? Why? What is the reason? Why hasn't somebody come up with a really, truly, honestly set of clothes that you never have to iron? There's no good reason not to have this. So I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating the reason for having to iron in the first place. Okay? Fine. I go in the shower after I iron. And... In the shower, I, I'm having flashbacks. I'm having these memory flashbacks of being in front of class, in front of all of you guys. Um, uh, I don't know, apologizing for something because that seems like be what I do half the time these days. Um, so I'm having this flashback in the shower, this memory flashback. All right, fine. That one's kind of boring, but whatever. Uh, I get out of the shower and I start to get dressed. Um, but when I get dressed, I, I, I'm pulling my pants on and they feel wet already. And I'm trying to figure out why are they wet. And I, and I smell the wet spot on my pants. That sounds wrong. Um, and, it, and it smells like lemons. And I realize somebody spilt lemonade on my pants. How rude is that? Now I have to iron another set of pants. What's the reason for that? Okay, fine. You get the idea. Um, I finally have my new pants on. I hop in my car. Um, but I realize as I'm getting into my car that, wait a minute, my car used to be metal, but now it seems to be made out of pottery. It seems like it's like stone, that like that light stone that we make uh, vases and stuff out of. Um, and I'm thinking, whoa, I'm going to have to be careful driving because pottery can crack. And so I'm going to have to be very careful with this car that's made out of pottery. All right. So I'm carefully driving the car. Um, I, I go to Mowat High School, I'm coming by Mowat High School, and, and you know how you stop on the road and people are begging you for money uh, at the corner? But at, at this corner, um, corner of Bridgeport and Lawrence, I guess, uh, there's a guy sitting there all right, but what he's doing is giving nibs to everybody, you know, those little licorice, those red candies, he's, he's giving them out instead of asking for money. Okay, that's weird, I take some nibs. I've only had a melon for breakfast so far and a little bit of toffee, so I start popping some nibs. That's cool. Excellent. I keep driving along Lawrence, and I go through that beautiful Highland Creek Valley area where the trees are out, and there's there's lots of nice colors, um, which, is, which is really good, except um, suddenly they've made it like a toll road. To go through the colorful leaves, you have to pay a bill first. So they stop me and they make me pay a bill for going through Highland Creek Valley, which is kind of annoying. They never did that before, but fine. I pay the bill. I go through Highland Creek Valley. Um, now I'm getting up around um, the military trail area, uh, and I come... Well, no, I'm not. Not yet. Um, I'm, I'm just cruising along, and I go by this church I always go by that's right by the Legion there has a beautiful stained glass uh, image on the front. But I, and I look at the stained glass, and what's weird is, is there's a picture of, of Jesus on the stained glass eating a donut. I never noticed he was eating a donut before. I didn't even know they had donuts in the time of Jesus. And so I'm like, wow, Jesus is eating a donut. That's odd. Fine. Um, I go a little further. I come to the mosque. Yes, the mosque that used to be a strip bar. I guess that's progress, right? That's good. Um, and outside the mosque, I also notice something odd. Um, I see a, a whole bunch of Islamic people going for prayer, um, but a bunch of them are knitting on the way in. There's a whole bunch of them knitting, and I, and I just think to myself, I, I don't think I've ever, I, I, I didn't know that was part of their culture. I didn't know they did knit. That's kind of strange, but I guess, why not? Fine. All right, so I go by, um, pull into the parking lot at UTSC, um, nappy. Um, I pull in the parking lot and all, all I can, when, when I hear the word nappy, I think of that, the controversy in sports a while ago where somebody referred to um, a, a women's basketball team as um, in, in a negative way and they were talking about their hair and he called them nappy headed um, because their hair was a little nappy and so when I'm in the parking lot they're talking about this again as I'm pulling in they're talking about the story and I'm thinking that's a two-year-old story at least a three-year-old story what the heck 
Um, that's kind of odd, but fine. Pull in, get to the coffee, get to the Tim Hortons, and while I'm waiting in line, I look up and I was like, holy crow, they put a, a, a skylight in Tim Hortons. How did they even do that? That doesn't seem to make sense. There's a floor above that. How, so I'm puzzling over the skylight in Tim Hortons. I don't have time. I finally get to class, uh, but when I walk into class, the paparazzi are there. There's a whole bunch of paparazzi waiting for me. And as soon as I step in there, they're snapping pictures and reporters are asking me questions. And suddenly I seem to be the focus of a whole bunch of publicity. Okay, now I'm going to immediately go to that next slide where I remove those words. So what I want you to realize, first of all, is yeah, I did some work. I did some serious work connecting those words to these words. Um, and that, you know, I, I don't even think I need these words. I'm, I'm going to just not even show the, these words. I'm just going to just zip, 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 zip. I'm going to be cocky about this. Um, but now, um, given that work I did, you know, how long did I think about each word? I'm relatively confident I can recall every one of those words. And again, I do it by, it would be really easy if I kept that list up that I just had. But now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it the real way, which is to actually go through the list as well. And so as we start, here we go. Um, I wake up in bed, I rolled over, and there's a tusk in bed. So tusk is the first word. I go down for breakfast, expecting something good. I get toffee for breakfast. Toffee was the next word. Um, I'm disappointed on that, but I walk my dogs, and I find a melon. And I sit down on the rock and have a melon. So melon is the third word. Um, I get back from my walk. This is where the list is hand helpful because I have to think of what I jump to. But I think the next thing I jump to is iron in that case because I typically iron then. And so I'm trying to puzzle over the reason to iron. Reason is the fourth word. Um, hop in the shower and I'm having a memory flashback. Um, I'm getting dressed and my pants have that wetness which is lemonade. Um, so lemonade was was the, what am I up to? Fifth word, I think. Um, so I've gotten dressed. I go in my car. My car is made out of pottery. All right. Hop in my car and I drive to mow it. And there's a person handing out nibs. So I get a nib at mow it. Um, I now go to Highland Creek, that valley. And um, it's a bill. There's a bill to get in there. So I have to pay the bill. Um, Am I already here? Go up by the church, um, and there's there's uh, Jesus eating a donut. So I see the donut for the church. Get to the mosque where they're knitting. Um, get to the parking lot where nappy. They're talking about that nappy-headed story again. Um, get to the coffee shop where there's the skylight, and I get to class where there's publicity, the publicity thing. Okay, so did I? Did I? Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me. Did I? Did I? Here we go. Did I get them all? I think I got them all. There we go. Um, so now here's the trick. I am now going to, I hope somebody wrote those down. Okay. Um, actually, let me, let, let me put them up for a second and I'll show you. I'm not paying attention. But if anybody didn't write them down, if somebody could take the time to do it and maybe maybe pause um, the screen and do it because I want to move on. Um, but the reason I'm, I'm suggesting you do that is because I'm going to close this now and I'm not going to save. Don't save. The reason I'm suggesting you do that is I, I recommend somebody a week or so from now ask me to try to recall those items again. And let's see if I can still do it. Um, I should be able to at least most of them. And, you know, let's kind of think about that. That's a pretty impressive feat, 14. I mean, I, I can show you again really quickly. We can do tusk, toffee, melon, reason, memory, lemonade, pottery, nib, bill, donut, knitting, Nappy, skylight, publicity. I hope I didn't miss anything. But did you notice what I'm doing? I'm in my mind, and what I'm doing is I'm going through my day. I'm going through those things, which helps me remember the first word, and then the imagery helps me remember the second word. So I put this information into memory, 
in a way that makes it really easy for me to get it back out. Okay, so with that demo in mind then, where's my, come on, um, let's go over here. Because we're really going to talk now about this encoding step. Oh yeah, that's a good song. I don't remember, I don't recall. Check it out, Peter Gabriel, good tune. Um, we're going to focus really on this encoding step. Uh, and this is, you know, you guys think of it probably in terms of the word studying. Uh, but this is a critical step for memory. If you want to be able to remember anything, a lot of your ability to do so depends on how you put it into memory. And so let's just jump right into that. So first of all, let me mention this book, Moonwi uh, Moonwalking with Einstein. It's really about the kind of thing I just did with you. So there is, there is this, this funny game. And I, okay, let me show you a little bit of this because it's kind of funny. If you, if you um, we could probably do YouTube. Sorry, I don't want to spill coffee on myself. If you go to YouTube, let's say, and you do Memory Olympics. Yes, there is a Memory Olympics. Um, military Memory Man. So let me, um, well anyway, you, you, you can check these out, but they're really crazy. I was kind of hoping there was one of the cards, um, but let's let's take a quick peek at this. You're all ready, go. Three, seven, Okay. <laughs> this has got to be one, the most boring video four, I've ever shown. One, five, four, I'm sure you're four, not listening along to the nine, numbers. So let three, me just say the point six, of this is zero, these zero, guys 
Ah. Oh, here we go. Let's see. This is the exciting part. So these guys are basically writing down those numbers. I don't know how many numbers there were there. Remember I told you um, in the last class that the average human uh, given a task like that can remember about 7 plus or minus 2. Now these guys are <laughs> a little better than that. Um, okay, they're not, they're not showing, um, but uh, these guys can remember things like hundreds of numbers. Like it wouldn't surprise me if somebody remembered every one of those numbers that person read. Um, and they do all sorts of other things too. With the deck of cards here, you would see uh, that they, they can give them sort of like uh, things like three shuffled decks of cards. And people go through them, they see them all, they put them away, and then they tell you what every card was in the order it was in. So, freaky, weird, you can see a lot of that um, online if you check it out. And so Joshua Four, who was a reporter, looked at these people and he said, essentially, are these people freaks? Like, do they just have some amazing memory? Um, or could anybody learn to do this? Is it just about the strategies they're using or is it about who they actually are? Okay, so I'm going to ignore that. Um, he ended up talking to a lot of these people and to a person they said, I am not a freak. Um, I have just worked really, really hard. And if you work really, really hard and learn the proper strategies, um, especially mostly they talk about here a memory palace strategy, which isn't altogether that different from what I did with my ordered route of the day. But instead they say take some place, a palace, if you will, that you know really well. You know all the crevices, all the rooms, all the whatever. And then when you're learning items like these numbers, put them in spots that you will travel in some predictable order. Uh, and so you mentally put these numbers in all of these spots in your memory palace as you walk through your memory palace. And then when it's time to retrieve, people start again at the front door and they walk around and they just basically kind of pick up the things they've stored. Kind of crazy. The interesting punchline is Joshua for himself isn't sure whether he believes that anybody could do this, so he goes into training. And I think he ends up finishing third in the US Memory Olympics or something like that. So the punchline is, if you do it right, you can remember a lot of crap. <laughs> In fact, his ultimate punchline in the book is, yeah, anybody can do this, but is it really useful? Does it help you in any way? And he ends up saying, in some situations, maybe, but in general, no. So I'll mention that book. Um, but here are the, the basic principles that come out of that book. And these principles are useful um, everywhere. So let me do this first principle with um, an example, an experiment of a sort. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a list of words. And list one, what I'm going to ask you to do is, what should I do for list one? Let's do this one. Are these words good words or bad words? Now, I'm not going to show you any truly bad words. I'll leave that for the movies and television. So these are all going to be relatively neutral words, but I want you to just kind of look at them and call about half of them good and about half of them bad. So just sort of quick, quick first vibe, whatever comes to you, do you want to think of this word as good or bad? Okay, so here we go. Here's the first word. Truck, good or bad? Printer, good or bad? Texas. Open. Boots. Needle. Rust. Kitten. Pale. Trip, raincoat, devil, guilt. I think that might be the last one. Right. Okay. Fine. Put those words aside. List two. I'm just going to show you words one at a time again. But this time, I just want you to tell me how many vowels are in the word. Okay. That's it. How many vowels? 
Here's the first one. Lucky. Consider a Y a vowel, so that would be two. Pillow. Water. Love. Orange. Adult. Quilt. Jailhouse. Yummy. Delta. Closet. Lip. Bigger. Okay, now here's what I want to do. Get rid of that too. All right, try to remember some words from those lists. As many as you can remember. Just write down words from those lists. I don't care about the order, just write them down. What words do you remember? Okay, <coughs> you can pause. If you want to remember more, press pause, keep remembering. Um, and then come back. And I'll just assume you're back. All right, you're back. Here's my prediction for most of you. My prediction is, uh, I gotta unveil this word, this thing again. My prediction is, you will have remembered more of these words than these words. Even though you saw those ones a while ago, actually, compared to these ones, these are fresher, but you'll remember more of these. Now, if I'm doing this in class, and when I'm doing this in class, I ask people, why did you call? So let me pick a word. Let me pick rust. Did you call the word rust good or bad? And what happened in your mind when you did so? How, what did you think about? What, what went through your mind? So for me, when I look at the word Rust, I think of a Neil Young album I love called Live Rust. So I would say Rust is good. Um, and, be, and, and I actually hear some, of the, hear some of the songs from that album being played. So, so, and I can almost see Neil Young playing some of these songs. So I have this pretty deep connection, almost like that bizarre imagery I was doing earlier. Um, for most of you, you probably thought of something like a car with rust on it. So again, that visual image, and you probably thought of it as a bad thing because of that. Good or bad doesn't matter. Just think about the kinds of things that went through your head when you were calling these good or bad. Now, think about these words. What went through your head when you saw pillow? Well, you probably went one, two. What about water? One, two. Love? One, two. Orange? One, two, three. Here you're doing what we call shallow encoding. You're not, you don't even really care what the word is. You're not thinking too much about what it means. You're kind of looking at the structure of the word, figuring out whether letters are vowels or consonants, and counting up the vowels. You're not getting the imagery um, and, and the, those sorts of associations that you are when you're doing the what we call the deeper encoding. We call this deep because you tend to bring up images and associations and, and, and link it to things and sometimes hear sounds. Um, sometimes this comes linked to specific people. Maybe there's somebody you know that looks really hot in a pair of boots. So when you saw the word boots, you thought of that person and you went, oh yeah. Okay, now you're having a personal connection to that as well. I bet you didn't have a lot of personal connections here. Okay, my bet is um, you barely even thought about these words. So the, the punchline here is when there's something you want to remember, let's say something from the course, the deeper you process it, the better you will remember it. Um, so when you think about something, let's say an independent variable, an independent variable is the variable that an experimenter manipulates in an experiment. You can do a couple of things with that. One is you can stay very shallow. You can just say to yourself, an independent variable is the variable that the experimenter manipulates in an experiment. The independent variable is a variable that the experimenter manipulates in an experiment. So you say it over and over and over again to yourself. So fine, to some extent you're learning that fact. Or you could do the following. Let me think of a few different experiments. Let me find some other experiments in the book. What was the independent variable there? And what was it here? And so now you're thinking about that concept in a richer, deeper way. You're connecting it with particular experiments. Oh yeah, in the memory experiment, he manipulated depth 
by asking us either to count vowels or say if it was good or bad. That's the thing he manipulated. That was the independent variable. When you do that deep processing, you form a much more rich, durable memory trace of what you're trying to remember. There's issues that come into this called things like dual coding. I mentioned this with like Rust, that not only do you see the word Rust, but you might actually see Rust on a car, so a visual image. Or you might hear Neil Young playing um, you know, a song off the live Rust album. Um, those are different ways of encoding the information. And when you take a bit of information and you code it for what it looks like and what it sounds like and the spelling of the word, those different multiple codes all become things you can remember that are all hooked to each other. And so they help you ultimately remember the item. Um, what it comes down to is this notion of retrieval cues. And this is a very important notion. What you put in your memory, kind of think of it in the following way. It's this rich tapestry of stuff. And now you're trying to remember it. And you have a little bit of it, like a multiple choice question that says, um, here's an experiment. What was the independent variable? So now you're thinking, independent variable. What do I know about an independent variable? So you have part of that concept, but you want to retrieve the other stuff you have associated with it. That part you have is called a retrieval cue. And the richer that is, the better the chance you will remember it. This is why in my example, I had all those retrieval cues, bed, breakfast, walk. They were all things I knew I could get out of my memory simply by going through my morning routine. And now they become things that are connected to the stuff I want to remember. And so they pull out. So when you process something deeply, you're forming all of these connections. And when you connect that thing you're trying to learn to other things, now any of these other things that you've connected it to can help you remember that thing you want to remember. So deep processing means a lot. And that's why I encourage you to do things like after you read a paragraph on something, create your own multiple choice questions. That don't do the false alternatives, but just say, if I was the prof, how would I ask a multiple choice question on this concept? By doing that, you're going to naturally think deeper about the concept. You're going to think about the different ways you could ask a question. All of those are going to help you remember that fact. Okay, so that's lesson one, deep encoding. Embedded in lesson two is the idea of using imagery and sound and anything else you can use um, to remember that item richly. The second one is the importance of structure. Remember in my example, um, I remember those 14 items. And I'll maybe try again right at the very end uh, if I have time. But I remember those 14 items, but I also remembered them in order. That's a tricky thing to do, to keep the order information all straight. Well, you know, it really wasn't a, a tricky thing to do because the retrieval cues I used were in order. Um, they included a certain structure to them, and because of that structure, it's easy for me to remember things pinned to that structure. So here's the point. Imagine it this way. You have either uh, you have a, a bunch of recipes you want to remember. So imagine these are all recipes. Imagine you have 200 of them. You could put them in a little box like this one, or you could put them in a great big box. If the ultimate goal is, at some point in the future, I'm going to want to know how to make that banana bread, and I'm going to want to find the banana bread. Is it better to have a great big box with all the cards just thrown in randomly, or a smaller box where they're put in in a very organized way. See, this says side dishes, I don't know, somewhere. So somewhere there would probably be desserts. You could find the desserts. And now if you had it alphabetically ordered, you could quickly get to banana bread, right? And, the, and this nice organizational structure helps you get that information back out of your recipe box very efficiently. So the analogy we're making here is to say it's not about how big or how strong your memory is. It's more about the way you put things into your memory. And if you put them in an organized way, it will be easier to get the information out. Um, so, you know, one example of this is 
again, that example I did where I went through from bed, breakfast, so I put the information in a very organized way. It allowed me to get it out in a very organized way. When you're studying, you may you know, very much want to, the concepts you learn, if you can imagine them in the structure of the chapter, okay, these concepts were all part of the encoding of memory thing. And so I'm going to learn them, um, but I'm going to also learn the structure within which they reside. Um, and if I get the structure of the chapter, so the chapter talked about learning, it talked about storage, it talked about retrieval, and now I know which concepts go with which part. When you study in that structured way, it's more work at encoding. Absolutely more work at encoding, just like this is, right? Putting the recipes in the right spot is key to making them easy to get out. It's way easier to just throw the recipes in a box. Way easier. And it's way easier to just throw things into your memory. But if you want to get them out later, you got to put them in in a structured way. Okay, so it's not about the size; it's about how things are stored. All right. Now, often when people talk about memory, they focus on wanting to be better. You know, I, I want to improve my memory. I want to have a really good memory. How can I do that? Um, what they don't realize is how important forgetting is. Uh, and so I urge you to check out on YouTube somebody named Jill Price. She has got one of the best memories in the world. She's got one of the best memories because she is in a sense an obsessive encoder. What I mean by that is you know of obsessive compulsive people. You've probably heard of them. They, they're the people that have to wash their hands every two minutes and they can't stop thinking about the germs on their hands or they can't stop worrying about whether they left their stove on and they they obsess, they obsess, they obsess, and then they're compelled to go do something about it. Well, Jill obsesses about every little thing that happens in her life. Everything that happens, she thinks about it, thinks about it, thinks about it very deeply, connects it to all this other stuff. She does this deep encoding all the time. The pro side of that, and you'll see this on YouTube, is they can ask her things about TV shows that happened 20 years ago. She knows it all. She remembers every detail. Um, she's got an amazing, amazing memory. But when you talk to her, she's not very happy because she also remembers every bad thing that happened to her in detail. For example, her mother once told her she was just a fat little girl. Probably just they were having an argument and whatever, and, and the mom said in a moment of weakness, you are a fat little girl. Jill obsessed on that. She thought about it over and over and connected it to 50 million things and she can hear her mother say that to her every day. She broke up with a boyfriend. She relives that breakup every single day. Um, so she's a great example that, you know, while remembering things is good, so is forgetting things. There are some things that we have to move on from and we don't want to keep thinking about over and over. And so psychologists are also interested in this interplay between memory and forgetting and when we think about memory we think the goal is not for people to have a perfect memory the goal is for them to be able to remember the things they want to remember and forget the things they want to forget you can do that mostly with good encoding as long as you don't take it over the top like Jill you know the stuff that's valuable to you that's the stuff you put the work into remembering um, the stuff that's not you don't um, so when crap is happening in your life, don't worry about it. Don't think about it too much. You know, kind of let it go. Uh, if you obsess like Jill, you will remember it and keep reliving it. So check out Jill. Very interesting um, little side story. Um, and and almost, a, almost a polar opposite to the Clive Waring story where he couldn't remember anything. Jill remembers everything. So check out those two and use those to think about memory a little bit. Okay, as my final trick as I leave, let's see, you know, I've gone on talking about a bunch of stuff. Remember we talked about short-term memory, how how um, prone it was to interference, how, how it's you know, hard to remember something, keep something in your mind if other people are spitting out words and stuff. Long-term memory is the kind of memory that allows something to live on even despite a bunch of other things happening in between. So it's a long-term memory we're really talking about here um, and the role that good encoding plays in producing a long-term memory. So let's go back to that list, which I haven't thought about, but let's see if I can do it. You wake up in bed, tusk. Go down for breakfast, toffee.
go on the walk with my dogs, melon. Um, come home and iron, what's the reason for that? Hop in the shower, memory, memory flashback. Put on my pants, lemonade. Go to the car, pottery. Um, go to, uh, um, I couldn't remember the name of the school, <laughs> mow it, mow it collegiate. There's the guy with the nibs. Um, going in the Highland Creek Valley area, I have to pay a bill. Go by the church, donut. Go by the mosque, knitting. Go into the parking lot, nappy. Go to the coffee, uh, Tim Hortons, skylight. Go to the class, publicity. Okay. So despite everything that I was talking and going on and obviously thinking about all these other things, because I put that information in in a structured way, because I used dual coding, I used all this imagery to help me remember those words, I end up with a pretty durable memory trace, one that at least lasted over a half an hour. Um, and yeah, ask me, you know, test me again to, to come up and try to remember that. And let's see if it can last days or even weeks. It gets harder. I, I, I'm not going to tell you I'll be perfect a week for, or two from now, but let's see. Let's see. Let's do an experiment. All right. So that's where I am. I will think of you guys while I'm while I'm in warm California and, and you guys have the polar vortex coming down on you. It won't be that warm. I'm in the San Fran area, so so don't feel like I'm on the deck going, it won't be like that. Um, but it'll be warmer than here, and that's important. Have a great uh, week. I will see you guys Monday morning. All right. Later, guys. Bye-bye.